Good afternoon. Uh, we're delighted to be joined by Gordon Brown, the Secretary General Special Envoy on Global Education, uh, who will also, in addition to this press conference, uh, be giving a speech uh, this afternoon at 6.15 in the ECOSOC chamber, uh, to which you are all invited to. Sir, welcome back, and you have the floor. Yeah, I want to thank you for coming at this uh, uh, more difficult time for you, and I want to outline two initiatives that I'll be talking about in more detail this evening and is contained in a, a fuller statement that is being issued to you on, 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 on email. The, the first is uh, to announce that following uh, what happened in Syria with the use of chemical weapons, particularly against children, and following President Trump's uh, remarks that many red lines had been crossed uh, and recognizing that this includes the militarization of children's schools, the use of children in militias, the abduction of children, the violation of girls, the forced marriage of girls. Uh, an inquiry is being set up to see if we can develop greater protections for children in conflict. Following Grasha Michelle's groundbreaking work in the 1990s, uh, a special representative for children in conflict uh, it reports uh, annually to the Security uh, Council. But there is a question as to whether the law, which I know the new uh, head of the International Criminal Court is also concerned about, is sufficiently strong to protect children from these violations and abuses. Uh, and that's why through Save the Children and uh, Their World, two charities, a review has been set up uh, that I am uh, helping move forward. And we want to find out whether, for example, there is a case for an international criminal court for children's cases. Only one has been uh, brought to a successful prosecution in all the life of the international criminal court on uh, a child militia. Uh, and whether other uh, domestic and international protections can be made available in law for children. As you know, there are more displaced children, 60 mil uh, 30 million, that at any time since 1945. There are 10 million child refugees. There are 75 million children caught up in conflict zones. And therefore, this inquiry, led by uh, a London QC, um, uh, Shahid Fatima, uh, will report as soon as possible on whether we should be urging greater and stronger protections in international law. I also want to announce uh, the second uh, initiative that we uh, believe is absolutely essential given our commitment to the Sustainable Development Goals uh, and the doubts that now exist as to whether we can meet these goals uh, without additional resources. Let me say that our estimate is that by 2030, when the Sustainable Development Goals deadline uh, is reached, there will still be on present trends, sadly, 200 million children out of school, of school age, there will be 400 million children, that is a quarter of the world's children, who will not even have primary school level skills, even although our commitment is that every child has quality secondary education. And there will be 800 million children, perhaps nearer 850 million children, who will be without the qualifications that are necessary for them to join the workforce as they leave school. In other words, half the world's 1.6 billion children will be without the qualifications that would be recognized as meeting the Sustainable Development Goal. And if we do not act now, we will not meet the Sustainable Development Goal on education in 2030 or 2050 or even in 2100. If we cannot devise a proper system of financing for education that matches and complements the reforms and modernizations that are necessary to deliver education for children, then millions of children will remain on the streets rather than in schools. Then girls in particular uh, will be the majority of those who lose out on education. And in conflict uh, zones, uh, uh, the vast majority of children uh, will not have the chance of education and they will fall prey to terrorist organizations exploiting the fact that we have made a promise and are not delivering it and therefore coexistence, they will argue, is impossible. At the moment, only uh, eight dollars per head per year is spent on aid in lower and middle income countries per child. That is not enough to pay for one textbook, far less to pay for a teacher or to pay for school buildings or to pay for the necessary elements of a school uh, curriculum. Uh, if we do not change that system and reform it, uh, then we will be far from our ability to meet these goals. 
When we reported as an education commission last year, we said that um, individual countries, lower and middle income countries, had to increase their performance to that of the best 25%. We said that they themselves had to spend more money on education, 4% to 5.8%. We said that the world itself had to raise the amount of aid spent on education from 10% to 15% as we move towards the 0.7% target. But we also said there was still a gap in funding that had to be met and that we wanted to create a new international facility uh, that would enable more funds to flow to education. Some of you may remember the advances made in the first 10 years of this century. Uh, HIPIC debt relief, where I was uh, involved uh, in writing off um, for 38 countries 100 billion of unpayable debt. We had the Gavi initiative for vaccination aligned to the Global Health Fund, great initiatives at the beginning of the century. Uh, and the, we had what's called the International Finance Mechanism for Immunization, uh, which has raised uh, $5 billion. Uh, and between these different uh, initiatives, 500 uh, million children have been vaccinated and 5 million lives saved. Now it's time to end the neglect of education. And so we're proposing an international finance facility for education where countries who are donor countries would give guarantees. On the basis of that, the development banks would borrow money for educational purposes. Uh, we would then uh, encourage countries to buy down the loans that were available into credits or into grants uh, to enable uh, countries that are lower middle income countries at the moment who can only borrow money at three or four percent uh, to pay for education at terms that they can afford. And we want to see the World Bank, uh, which has got its IDA facility, increase the money available to education from 1.6 billion at the moment to 4.5 billion by 2020. And that would help the 200 million children in lower income countries. So we have a very specific proposal uh, to put forward to solve the financing gap in global education. We believe it would help us meet um, Sustainable Development Goal 1 and 2 on famine and poverty. It would enable us to help and unlock what we can achieve on health. Remember that um, an uneducated girl in Africa has five children, uh, an educated girl has two children, uh, and we need to break this vicious cycle of um, illiterate uh, uh, young girls, high levels of birth rates, uh, low national incomes per head, and in some cases, as a result, big levels of emigration. Um, our proposal, uh, we believe, would by 2050 increase the GDPs of many countries by 70% because of the investments in education, would increase employment prospects, cut infant and maternal mortality, and at the same time, uh, boost the quality of life of millions of people uh, around the world. So today, in a world where protectionism and confrontation is on the rise, and international cooperation is in decline. I believe that this initiative makes the case for cooperation uh, at a global level and for global solutions to global problems. And this is one of the proposals that is on the table this week as we discuss uh, international uh, issues at the World Bank's annual meeting. Our goal is nothing less than to be the first generation in history where every single child has a chance to go to school. And we believe that the proposals that we are putting forward, first of all, to protect children, and particularly girls, and secondly, to finance education, are two of the most important changes that can be made and need to be made now if we are going to be the first generation in history, indeed, where every child is at school. I'm happy to answer any questions. You have a fuller statement that's been issued with this, and I'm speaking at um, 6.15 in uh, the ECOSOC um, Hall uh, to outline these proposals in more detail. Evelyn? Thank you, Thank you Mr. Again. Brown. Uh, Evelyn Leopold, Huffington Post contributor. And uh, welcome on behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Thank Association. Um, on accountability and red lines and Syria and so forth, um, there is a commission of inquiry in Geneva at the Human Rights Council. There is also uh, Ambassador Venevasa, who's trying to collect things in the General Assembly. Are you all going to combine it? Are you giving him any information or any of these other groups? Are you all going to get together? Yeah, so the, there can be a persona non grata list. Yeah, the, 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 pro the problem is, as you know, the International Criminal Court 
uh, does not have in its membership uh, countries that are accused of perpetrating these crimes. And the problem also is that the only way around this is for a Security Council agreement on a reference to the International Criminal Court, which at the moment is not uh, 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 possible. We are particularly concerned about the violations of children's rights throughout the Syrian conflict, but we know this is happening in Yemen, it's happening in Iraq, it's happening in Libya, it's happening in Nigeria, it's happening in other states in Africa, uh, and we believe that we have neglected for too long uh, the violations uh, and the abuses of children's rights uh, that have become so manifold and so obvious to those people who look at these issues. So we are an addition and a complement to the important work being done by the Human Rights Council uh, and by the attempt of the General Assembly to have a, a further review into the, um, the Syrian uh, conflict. And we are looking not just at Syria, but we're looking at children who have been persecuted as we know, in Iraq and Mosul at the moment, I've seen reports in the last uh, few days on this, uh, we know what's happening in Yemen when child militias are being mobilized. We know in South Sudan that children are being forced into, um, being recruited into the army. We know of one instance where children who were at school were forcibly taken out of school in South Sudan, and the army commanders who were wanted to use them in the child militias gave them permission to go back to school to sit their exams as long as they would come then to the child militias later. And these are situations that we cannot allow to continue. I, I respect the great work that's been done by the special representatives of children in conflict, but it's time to look at whether the law is good enough to protect the rights of children. In particular, of course, I'm concerned about the rights of children free of uh, child marriage, free of child labor, free of child exploitation, to be in schools and not to be forced into these exploitative uh, conditions. We want uh, opportunity and not oppression for children. Great. Uh, hi, uh, Matthias Ask, uh, TV to Norway. Thank you for the briefing. Uh, about the possible uh, International Children's Court uh, to protect the rights of, uh, of children, how would you go about trying to avoid the same problems with, for example, the International Criminal Court, namely that it's not recognized by uh, many countries? Can, can I just say, uh, because you represent Norway, it, it's appropriate for me to, to thank the Norwegian government for their leadership in the International Commission for Financing Education and the leadership on the educational issues, that's on health issues across, across the world. Uh, and our proposals could have not been possible, would have not been possible without the support that has been given us uh, by the Norwegian Prime Minister, uh, the Norwegian Foreign Minister, and the, and the Norwegian government. And it's important to recognize that the advances we are ma we're making here have been made possible by this. As far as uh, one of the proposals is to look at whether, given the... Um, nature of crimes against children, whether it would be more appropriate to have a different uh, court dealing with these at an international level. One, because you would be able to cover more violations of children's rights than are covered by the remit of the International Criminal Court. And second, because there may be more public support in, 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 in different countries for signing up to that International Criminal Court. So it is possible that an International Criminal Court for Children would find other countries that have not signed up to the ICC being prepared to recognize the importance of children's rights. But I, I do stress this is only one of the proposals we're looking at. A lot of the answers lie in improved domestic laws. Uh, for dealing with violations of children's rights, children's commissioners, children's ombudsmen that can actually stand up for the rights of children in countries even where there are conflicts that these voices can be heard. And some of the proposals refer not just to international law itself, but to the implementation of international law and why cases uh, take so long to come to court. Ali, then Mr. Abedi, call. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, my name is Ali Barada. I'm uh, from Lebanon. Uh, I work for an Nahar newspaper in Lebanon and for France 24 in, in Paris. In fact, uh, I read recently uh, a study here in the U.S. about the uh, uh, private participation in the education of the Syrian refugees. And uh, there are uh, questions about that the private sector is participating in this uh, investment, let's say, uh, to raise their uh, trademark or uh, for their own purposes. Uh, they're doing good for the refugees sometimes, but is there a line where we should separate the participation of the private sector 
and the role of the uh, governments and the states. Well, let, let me say in, in Lebanon, because I have visited Lebanon and know the situation there, that on the ground, the major provision for education for Syrian refugees is being done by governments and by aid agencies. They are supporting what has been an initiative that I have repeatedly praised the Lebanese government for, where they have allowed Syrian refugees to use in a double shift system the existing schools in Lebanon, and there are more than 200,000 uh, young Syrian refugees who are now being educated in the afternoons in Lebanese schools, uh, and the issue uh, there is not the shortage of teachers nor the shortage of school facilities. The issue, I'm afraid, is the shortage of money. If there was more money, we could educate probably 400,000 Syrian refugees. This is one of our problems, the shortage of money that is available. So the main provision I do stress to you is uh, from uh, uh, the public sector, from governments. And I'm not... Well, I, I'm, not a, I'm not aware of the big projects that you're talking about in the private sector. I am aware, however, of philanthropic projects that are, that are widely praised both in Lebanon and in the region. Uh, one I want to mention today is the peer uh, initiative, which is to provide access through the Internet for teenagers uh, in, who are Syrian refugees to get the chance of college and university education. And the International Institute of Education, thanks to help from Catalyst, a foundation that I've been involved in, have given uh, uh, money uh, to enable a website to be set up. And hundreds of Syrian uh, students are now able to apply through that website and link themselves to universities and colleges in America, in Europe, that are prepared to offer them scholarships. So this is an example not of a private um, enterprise initiative by a company, but of a charity that has been set up uh, specifically to help Syrian refugees get education, uh, not just in Lebanon, Turkey and Jordan, but right across the world. Uh, and because it's a website that is now widely used and it can link, uh, it's, a, it's an agency that can bring together the colleges that are offering places with the students who need places, then we have great hopes that that will allow hundreds of um, thousands of people over time, not just in the Syrian conflict, but elsewhere, to be able to draw on this uh, website to get linked up to universities and colleges. So these are the big initiatives that I'm aware of. Mr. Abedi, and then Carla. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for this briefing. Given the fact that the international community set out a goal for 2030 in the educational field, and the fact that you said that if action is not taken, they, it may not be met by 2100. How realistic are these proposals, one? And second, you alluded to the decline in international cooperation. Do you think this phenomena is temporary? I, I believe that we have to prove, uh, uh, given the skeptical world, that in each instance where we make proposals, that they will be working and, and be very effective. And that's why... I say to you, if our proposals were accepted, so first of all, countries themselves that are way behind, uh, some countries are 100 years behind uh, Western education systems, uh, and Japanese and, uh, and Taiwanese and Korean education systems. And if they were to, first of all, decide that they would modernize and reform and try to reach the level of the top performers, if they decided they were prepared to spend themselves more on education from an average of 4% of their national income, that's low- and middle-income countries, to nearly 6%, 5.8%, and if the world community was prepared to honor its promises on aid uh, and develop the innovative facilities that I'm talking about that once were applied for debt relief and then for health and then for climate change, but these ideas now need to be developed in the appropriate way for education, then yes, we can meet this goal. And we've got 13 years uh, to do this by 2030. If we start now and take the initiatives that I'm talking about, we can achieve them. But if we continue to neglect education and see it as a declining proportion of aid and allow countries that are not investing in their own education system to be free of criticism and scrutiny, then we will not meet these goals. So it's important that we recognize that this is a turning point for education. There are proposals. Uh, they can be implemented, they can make the difference. We can help those 800 million children who are in danger of leaving school without qualifications worth their name. Half the world's children. In 2030, there'll be 1.6 billion children in the world. 
we reckon that 400 million will not have primary level qualifications, 850 million will not have secondary level qualifications unless we act now. Thank you. Carla? Sorry? Yes, and international cooperation is essential to this because when we created the health facilities, the Global Health Fund and the Fund for Immunization, this was an international cooperative effort. When we created the climate change initiatives in Paris, it was an international effort. When we did debt relief, it was countries who were owed money who came together to say that they would pr be prepared to relieve these debts. And it's the same in education. We need donor countries who are prepared to cooperate with each other to come together voluntarily, voluntarily, uh, to make the difference that is necessary. And we are proposing that individual countries come forward as guarantors of this new facility, and this is exactly what happened with the health facility, and that we then build on that to create the momentum uh, for meeting the 2030 goal. Remember, Amina Mohammed has talked about turning billions into trillions by the innovative use of finance to achieve that, and this is one project that can achieve it. Well, that, that's a different question that's more general than the question on, on education. And uh, I'm talking today about education. I'm saying that the decline of aid to education, 13% to 10%, is incredibly damaging. And I'm saying we can persuade people that the money invested in education can actually create economic growth, reduce infant mortality and maternal mortality, improve health outcomes generally, improve quality of life and improve education, economic performance. So I'm saying that we've got to put the arguments uh, that make international cooperation uh, from something that is uh, blamed for many of our problems to something that is seen as the solution to many of our problems. Carla, then Matthew, then Nina. Thank you for your always very sane concerns. Um, I, I was really quite aghast at the statistic that you gave. And I'm afraid you're correct. Uh, I just wanted to clarify one thing yep. before I ask a question. You said by 2030, a quarter of the world's children would not have primary school education? Would not have primary level qualifications. So they may have been at primary school, but they will leave school and not go into secondary education uh, or get any benefit from secondary education, and they will end up as people entering the labor force with nothing more than... Uh, uh, not even, not even is the word, uh, primary school level qualifications in literacy and numeracy. Um, as Four, far... 400 million is the figure. And, and when it comes to secondary level qualifications, it, the figure is 800 million. And that is out of 1.6 million children, 1.5 million of the billion, sorry, of them uh, in lower and middle income countries. The, um, it seems as though the world is headed more toward uh, confrontation than toward a, a focus on solving these problems, which you're quite absolutely correct in, in being concerned about. Um, the, your country, my country, and France have boycotted the, uh, the United Nations Conference to uh, negotiate a treaty to uh, prohibit nuclear weapons. And the trillions of dollars that are being spent by my country, your country, and God knows how many others on nuclear weapons could be spent financing global education and health care. Is there anything that can be done to persuade um, a rethinking of, of a world that's headed toward another war, it does seem, begin to seem, uh, toward a world that's headed toward human development? Well, you, you know that um, when we were in government in the United Kingdom, we launched a number of measures to try to bring about um, a lessening of nuclear tension and to bring about um, uh, greater uh, attention to nuclear disarmament. But, but I'm not the UN envoy on that. I'm the UN envoy on global education. And I, I want to stick strictly to the remit that I've got. Yes, there are ways that by decreasing expenditure in other areas, we could increase expenditure in education, and there's no doubt about that. But I'm putting forward a proposal today that is quite unique, that um, is uh, different from any other proposal we've had on education, that we create a new international finance facility for education. We mobilize donors to give guarantees. Uh, when they give guarantees that allow us to raise loans, uh, we then convert these loans into credits or grants uh, to enable some of the poorest children in the world to get to school for the first time. And that's where I want to focus my attention. In the statement that is uh, circulated, the written statement, which I didn't uh, go into detail on uh, uh, t in, in my remarks, uh, President Kikwete, the former president of Tanzania, 
uh, with Caroline Kent Robb, who has been uh, uh, Kofi Annan's uh, advisor, have been uh, at the request of our commission going around Africa and now are going around Asia to talk to the leaders of these countries at a presidential and prime ministerial level about their commitment to this initiative. And we have uh, letters of support and uh, testimonials from uh, many of these leaders in Africa wanting this facility to be created and understanding if we don't have a step change in the way that we treat education, then we will not uh, make the progress that we need to make. So uh, we have um, been talking to the World Bank and uh, the regional development banks. We've been talking to donors in Europe and elsewhere. And now we're talking to the uh, African uh, countries themselves. And I've had talks with the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, the President of Sri Lanka. We're talking to the, I talked to the Prime Minister of Pakistan last week, uh, Burma. Uh, I've had uh, communication with Aung San Suu Kyi. And, and all of them want to see this uh, education initiative getting off the ground uh, because they know in their own countries that they've got large numbers of out-of-school children, but they've also got large numbers of children at school who are not learning in the way that they should. So we have built up support across Africa and across Asia uh, for this facility from the countries that are low- and middle-income countries, but we're also building up support from donors. This is a major initiative that will come to... Uh, that will take s several months for it to be finally developed, but I believe we've got sufficient support to go ahead. Matthew? Sure, thanks a lot. Matthew Lee, Inner City Press, on behalf of the Free UN Coalition for Access, thanks again for coming to do this briefing. Pleasure. Pleasure. I wanted to ask you about so, a couple of things about the, the UN and education. Yes. One is since the last time you've been here, it's, it's uh, emerged that the UN peacekeeping mission in the Central African Republic itself used schools as a military base, mm -hmm. which is something I know that your office has been critical of armies for doing. Mm -hmm. What's, what are the provisions for the UN itself not using it? There's also a, a case in South Sudan where um, to take a test, uh, students were made to leave a UN protection of civilian site where they felt safe and, and were told by the government you have to leave the site to take the test. Many of them didn't take the test. And I wanted to know, since it seems the mission didn't do anything about that, whether that's the kind of thing your office can work on. And I, finally, since you mentioned the Internet, I wanted to know whether you're aware of the situation in the Anglophone areas of Cameroon, where the Internet has been turned off for 91 days now, including in schools, and whether you see that as something that your office could work on. And I wanted to ask Stefan one thing. I just noticed here now that the press conference of the African Union uh, uh, has been canceled. So I wanted to know, can you explain that, and, and why wasn't sure, the stakeout uh, uh, co-moderated by the African Union? The AU uh, just texted me, said they canceled sure. the press conference. Why wasn't the stakeout yeah, co-moderated yeah, by them? Because I moderated it. Okay. Well, it's good of them so, to give me the chance to speak. <laughs> Steve, you have more time now. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I, I don't want to, to cut across your, your, no, no, your, your no, explanation. No, but no, no, no. but you're, you're raising – look, education appeals in Africa – for money in conflict zones, and I include all the countries that you've mentioned, um, South Sudan is one of them, education appeals that were issued for Syria perhaps got a 40% response. There was an education appeal because of difficulties in South Sudan. It got 2.5% of what was asked for. Burkina Faso, 1.7%. Chad, 0.5%. Uh, Gambia, 0.5%. So as long as we, the international community, cannot support uh, children getting, at school, getting to school in these conflict zones or in these emergencies, uh, then we will run into major uh, problems. As a result of that, children will be on the streets, they'll be recruited to militias, uh, schools will be abused by conflicting uh, parties, girls will be violated, uh, and we will have all the repetition of some of the incidents that you have, you, you have mentioned. So we must start by taking uh, the education of children seriously. It is possible, even in a conflict zone, for children to be educated and to be at school or to be in education. It is possible, as you rightly said, that the Internet could be better used in areas which are remote and areas where uh, children don't have a formal uh, teacher uh, available. But we must recognize that when we... When we have appeals in emergency uh, and in conflict zones and we respond by giving not 0.5% of what is asked, then you cannot expect that these countries are in a position to run a successful education system. I just want to ask one, I just want to be clear that it's not about remote areas. In the case of Cameroon, it's the government yeah, yeah. intentionally cutting the internet for now yeah, 91 I, I, days. I understand what you, I understand what you're saying, but I, I'm also saying to, sure. saying to you that where, where there are 75 million children today in conflict zones, and where in some cases it is impossible to reach them, 
uh, then there are other methods that, that can be used, and we've been uh, stressing. And this is where the private sector that was mentioned before can come in, that the internet companies should be coming together, uh, not to promote their own brands, but to come together uh, to jointly provide internet services in some of these countries. Nina? Nina from I24. Um, I wondered, are you planning any kind of international donor conference for this? And do you have a shortage of teaching staff? Uh, I think one of the interesting things about the, the Middle East um, uh, challenges is that in countries like Lebanon, there is not a shortage of teachers, um, but there is a shortage of money to pay for teachers. Uh, so in, in Syria, uh, three uh, vicinities, uh, Lebanon, Turkey, and Jordan, if we had more money, uh, we could get the teachers and we could get the children to school. Now, that doesn't mean to say that we are not short of qualified teachers. Right around the world, we need more qualified teachers, and we need to raise the status of the teaching uh, profession and we need to raise the quality of teacher training. And one of the proposals of our Education Commission is that we do exactly that, that we invest more in the status and the training and the professionalism uh, of, of, of teachers. And we make sure that there is the same discipline imposed on teachers turning up for school as there is for children uh, turning up for school. That needs to be improved in all cases. And we want to work with the education, the teachers' unions, Education International, uh, to make for a better deal for teachers. So that is uh, one, of the, one of the issues that, that has come out of the Commission report. Um, can I just ask you, what kind of figure are you hoping to raise? You say you need more money. What, what kind of figures are we talking about? Well, we, we think that um, the International Finance Facility could raise 10 billions. So if you think that education aid at the moment is about 12 billion, so we're effectively trying to double education aid. We reckon that if we could get two billion of guarantees from countries that include the donor countries at the moment, and if we can back that up by two billion in grants to buy down loans and convert them into, um, into credits, then we could, because of the way that you can uh, raise money on the basis of guarantees, increase education expenditure for that investment by about nine to nine and a half billion a year. Thank you. Um, does your agency um, is having any concerns in terms of what's happening in Venezuela for children? Right now, the economical situation and also the uh, uprise in the streets, um, the lack of food and um, everything that is happening between the government and the opposition has pushed kids to not be able to receive the accurate ed education. Forty percent of the teachers um, in any given day is keep a class don't go to work because they want to go into the lines and wait to try to get food, which is the way they're now pretty much operating to be able to get the minimum um, household basic goods. Um, what the UN, United Nations and your agency will be able to uh, foresee in terms of education for children like this in, in Venezuela, which is a country that is not like Syria that is um, getting all the attention? Oil. Yeah, the, the, we, 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 um, we, we obviously don't have reports on what's happening in every uh, country in, in my capacity as a UN envoy for, for education. Uh, but where there are um, uh, reports, like just today in, on Mosul in, in Iraq, or, or where reports came through on Idlib in, uh, in, uh, in Syria, where incidentally not, not only the chemical attack happened, but also a school was bombed uh, deliberately by uh, Syrian or Russian warplanes on October the 26th, and 30 children died. And there should have been a Security Council um, uh, resolution to put that to the International Criminal Court. So I can only comment where uh, issues are, are raised uh, with me. But in general terms, you're absolutely right, where children are deprived of uh, education, either because the schools can't open or because uh, teachers uh, are not uh, uh, present. Uh, then we have to draw people's attention to that. These are the rights of children to education, a fundamental human right being breached. And in every situation where that's happened it's in, or happens, it's important that we draw attention to the, the damage that is being done uh, to children and to their potential uh, and to their hope that they can plan and prepare for a future. Uh, if they're not in school, it's very difficult for them to do that. Stephanie. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Dr. Brown. In the, in the process of the formulation of these proposals, to what extent have you consulted with UNESCO? UNESCO was one of the sponsors of this report. So we had four uh, sponsors. We had Norway, Indonesia, uh, Malawi, 
uh, Chile uh, and, uh, with UNESCO uh, and Irina Bokova uh, as uh, supportive. And on our commission, if I may remind you, we had Tony Lake, the head of UNICEF. We had uh, Julia Gillard, the head of the Global Partnership for Education. Uh, we had um, the, um, the uh, Jim Kim, the president of the, of, 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 of the World Bank, and we had uh, presidents and prime ministers and educationalists from all over the world, including um, President Barroso, who had just retired as head of the European Commission. We had uh, Heli Thorning-Schmidt, who had just retired as president of um, the prime minister of, of Denmark. We had Jack Ma from uh, China, the Alibaba. We had Ang Aliko Dangote, the Nigerian uh, business leader, and uh, we had um, Grasha Michel, uh, who was uh, obviously one of the leaders in education over many, many years and still is. So we, we had a very big representation. Larry Summers was on from uh, America as the former Treasury Secretary, so we had a, a large number of important uh, uh, um, positions that um, represented on this commission. Great. Carl, I think we have to let uh, Mr. Brown go. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Um,